All right, welcome everyone. Today we are delighted to have a guest lecture by Adrian Daka, who developed a lot of the uh, methods that we have been learning about for image analysis for medical data. So, Adrian, pleasure to have you. Take it away. Sure, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here. So, I'm going to talk about machine learning tools for image alignment for, for medical um, applications. And, well, I don't know how it works here, but, you know, please, in my, from my opinion, please interrupt if you have questions. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk mostly about neuroimages, uh, in particular brain MRI, but everything I talk about today applies broadly. So, you know, in many applications that you might have in your head, uh, this, this might apply. Okay, so medical images uh, sort of provide a lot of information about human anatomy. So in my PhD, I did a lot of work on analyzing medical images in one way or another. We did things like... Uh, finding, devel developing algorithms that delineate um, anatomy, delineate uh, disease, delineate certain structures we care about. Um, we did analyses that captured how something changes with age. So for example, a spatial disease in the brain might have a particular pattern and we modeled that uh, pattern and tried to make predictions correlated with anatomy, uh, with a clinical output. We even did things like predicting the future of a brain. So you take a brain, you take a spatial disease, and you take some other factors about a patient like genetics and clinical variables they might have, and you look at how can we predict what this person is going to look like or their brain is going to look like 10 years down the road. And that gives us all kinds of information we want for treatment and so on. But at the core of basically everything I did in my PhD, there was this one operation that was central to everything, which was aligning images to um, a common reference frame. And it's so central that um, it's been developed over many, many years, but we had one big problem at the time. We were really, really, you know, like young students, we really wanted to uh, come up with really fancy models for our data. But just this registration step uh, or alignment step took two hours for every brain. And um, that was a problem because every time we wanted to align something, it would take forever because we had thousands of brains to analyze. But not only was it a problem that we had to one time align these brains, but it was a problem in that we couldn't develop sophisticated models because these models as, a, as an internal step had to do alignment. And so it was just very prohibitive. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today is significantly faster. Um, it's that little bar at the bottom there. It's, a, it's less than a minute on a CPU. It's less than a second on a GPU. And that's fast, and it's, I'm sort of jealous of all the students who get to use this now. But more than that, it really changes the way we do research in this, in, in this sort of arena. And that's the part I'm really excited about. OK, so let me get a little more precise. When I talk about registration, I mean you're given two images. Usually they're big 3D volumes. And what you want is this deformation field. At every location, you have a little arrow that tells you how to move one image so that it matches up with another image. Okay. So the goal is this deformation field. And just to illustrate you know, how fundamental this is, we align or register brains to a template all the time. We register subjects between each other all the time to kind of compare anatomy. We align a subject before and after surgery, 10 years ago to now, to see how something has changed, to see how a tumor has grown. We propagate information from one to another, from one brain to another, so parts of anatomy and that sort of thing. And all of this is related to alignment in a lot of other domains, computer vision, even computational biology, where I actually got my start in research when I was aligning DNA sequences. So it's all kind of related. And so because of the importance of this, people have done a tremendous amount of work. And it all boils down to this one optimization problem. Basically, you want to find this deformation field that um, the I'll, I'll be using this notation a lot, this deformation field. And this deformation field should have two properties. The first is that it matches up images well. well that's pretty simple, right? 
The second is that it should be regularized in some way. So this is a fairly standard optimization strategy or sort of setup. And over decades, people have done better and better image matching terms, better and better smoothness terms, better ways to optimize the whole thing. It's, it's been a lot of research. So it's great. But at the end of the day, this is a slow process because you get these two 3D images. You pretend you've never seen images before and you start wiggling them around. So it takes a couple hours, as I mentioned. Adrian, can I ask yeah. you a you know, very general question? I looked ahead at your slides and I couldn't find the answer. So I'm going to ask sure. you now, which is, if I do um, image stitching, when I, you know, back, back before our phones did it automatically, yeah. it's one thing to warp with a field and it's another to actually match landmarks with each other. Right. So I'm curious whether the field has been looking, and um, by field, I mean the discipline, has been looking at just fields or also landmarks because the two are very different because I could be off by a millimeter in my landmark, I'll know immediately, but I could be off by a lot more in my field and I, I might not even notice. Right, so as you say, in some sense, they're very related. What, what I will say the relationship is and what the field has done is they have used landmarks to match up parts of the brain and then from those landmarks, they interpolate field, fields for everything else. Perfect, beautiful. So it's yeah. sort of, it's not one giant field, it's a bunch of subfields in between landmarks, basically. So that, so that is one branch of it, yes. A lot of, a lot of uh, research is like that, but a lot of it doesn't do landmarks at all. A lot of it is just automatically find a dense field. Perfect, thank yeah. you. Um, so, Around, I want to say three years ago, learning-based methods came around and tried to tackle this problem. Now, the very interesting things, as with most learning-based things, I think, these methods completely forgot the decades of, of research that had been done in, in registration, and they said, we're going to treat this as a black box problem. We're going to assume you get these two images, you put them through this black box CNN, you get a deformation field out, and I'm going to use some sort of supervision. What that means is I need to get a really large data set that has pairs of images and the ground truth deformation field between them, and I treat this as one big regression problem. And this was a great idea, um, and there was some work that showed that this is possible, but the problem is we never really have this ground truth deformation field. You can't really get it from experts because an expert would need hours or days to draw out all these little arrows. They could do landmarks, but that's also extremely costly because this is all in 3D, so it's really hard to kind of find correspondences. You could run simulations, but in the end, it wasn't a very sort of uh, elegant end-to-end -end solution that everyone could use. And so this is the part where we kind of came on the scene. And we thought, well, everybody has one thing, which is data. Everyone has data that's unlabeled. And so could we use just these images to learn the same thing? And so this is the method I'm going to talk about today and all the follow-up work. Okay, so as I said, before we kind of came on the scene, all of these kind of forgot about all the classical models, all the information in registration methods, but they were really, really fast because it was all just a feed-forward neural network now. So I'm going to have basically two parts in the rest of the talk. First, I'm going to talk about the, the fundamental model uh, it's not complicated at all, uh, but, uh, but I, if anyone gets stuck at all here, please let me know because everything that follows assumes you fully understood it. And then I'm going to talk about a bunch of different projects that we've done since then that I'm really excited about because they've really opened up the way we think about registration and downstream um, sort of modeling and work. All right, so the framework's really easy if you have ground truth deformation. You get two images, you push them through a neural network. Nowadays, it's mostly a unit, although I guess now it's changing to transformers or something. But it's just a neural network, and you get a deformation field out. And how do you tell the neural network whether it got the right deformation field? Well, you have the supervised data, and you take the difference in some way. So let's assume we don't have these deformation fields. How do we tell the neural network that it did a good job or not? And so. This is where we started looking at these classical models and try to borrow from those developments. And it turns out we always had a way to tell the algorithm where, whether it does a good job or not. We can just take those loss functions that we used to optimize, a single deformation field, and now we're going to optimize a whole neural network based on those fields. 
So for example, this is what I talked about before. You have a loss function that says, well, this field better match up the images, and it has to be smooth. And you don't just apply it to one image, but you apply it to all the images in the data set. So you keep feeding random image pairs to your network. The deformation field has to have a low uh, loss under this. And again, I'm not optimizing deformation fields here. I'm optimizing a network that gives me deformation fields, right? So it's borrowing from classical methods in that I'm using those loss function based intuitions. But of course, I'm optimizing neural networks, so I have to use, or we use stochastic gradient techniques and that sort of thing. Now, how do we make sure these, these, these losses are differentiable? Well, you, for some of them, it's pretty easy. For some of them, it's, it's a little harder. But at the end of the day, you take the deformation field, you actually warp an image. The way you do that is just linear interpolation, really. And then you have your two images, so you can compare them in fancy ways or in simple ways. And you can check whether your deformation field is smooth by taking spatial gradients. So it's actually pretty easy to implement this whole thing. Um, again, use stochastic gradient techniques. Um, and at the end of the day, you learn this big network that outputs this deformation field. And the cool thing is you've never, never really needed a ground truth deformation field as an example. So any data you have lying around, you can train this network. Now, as, uh, underneath all this, we published a bunch of papers that show that there's actually really nice theoretical connections to a bunch of other things. For example, to probabilistic models. Our field, for a long time, developed these probabilistic models that you know, offered you all kinds of elegant sort of connections between images, between deformation fields, uncertainty estimates, all that sort of thing. I don't want to go into detail now, but I'm happy to take questions. But essentially, if you set up these probabilistic models and you try to do inference, and you try to approximate that inference with neural networks, you end up to this solution. So that's pretty nice because you have some sort of grounding underneath. Um, so any questions on that setup? Looks good. OK. So, this, so does this actually work? Um, and it, it's actually, it's not a trivial question, but the, the first thing we cared about, right, was how fast is it? Because the whole kind of problem was that things took too long. And so we tested a bunch of sort of optimization baselines. You know, you got some of them took two hours and they were very, very, very good. And some of them maybe had slight losses in accuracy, but they were 10 minutes, 20 minutes. So that was better. Um, but then we, we ran Voxelmorph at the time. So this was two and a half years ago or something. It was less than a minute on a CPU, less than a second on a GPU. So that was cool because you could get the whole output uh, very, very fast. It's obviously faster now. But how do we know if we, do, if we actually do a good job? And so the way you actually do it, um, well, so if you want to just align one image, take one image, morph it, and compare it to the second image, you might think you're doing a good job, but realistically you might not because the deformation field might not be smooth. Maybe it's copying some pixel from the background and it's moving it in the middle of the brain. It's really hard to figure that out. And so what we actually do is we outline anatomy for evaluation. So here you can see that I've created this, uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, you can see that I've created these uh, outlines here around the ventricles and the hippocampi. I mean, these are just structures in the brain. I've done it in the moving image. I've done it in the fixed image. And now when I warp this first image, I check that the anatomy matches up. And so you can see visually that they kind of match up, right? The ventricles look about the same and so on. So qualitatively, it looks like it's doing a good job. But now how do I, you know, quantitatively look at like this? Well, I, I, I measure, I, I do some sort of volume overlap measure, right? So here, higher is better. Um, on the x-axis is a bunch of different anatomical structures we outlined. And the bottom line is that this algorithm voxel morph is basically the same as the baseline while it's orders of magnitude faster. So what's happening here is that this neural network is able to estimate the output of an optimization procedure. So that's, that's pretty cool because now we can do all kinds of modeling with this approximation. 
So I'm going to move on to all these other kind of things. First, we did a bunch of analysis on what this means, and then uh, a few kind of small uh, projects. Um, all right, so the question that we always got. So when we first train Voxelmorph, we just gathered all the data we could because we thought, well, neural networks, neural networks need a lot of data. So let's, let's kind of train uh, really large, you know, with really large data. But everyone came and asked us, well, yeah, but I only have like 50 images around. Can I still use your neural network? And so we did this analysis. Now, at the time, we had no bells and whistles, no data augmentation, no nothing fancy. And we trained four models with just 10 images, 25, 50, and 100. And we found that you get pretty close to the state of the art, even with just 10 images. Not perfect. You need 50 or 100 to really get to the state of the art. But with just 10 images, you got close. And so that made us think, well, if the deformation field is almost right, couldn't we just take that output from Voxelmorph and just optimize it a little bit for just a few seconds, just wiggle those, those uh, vectors around. And it turns out that if you do that for just 20 seconds, you get to the state of the art or better. And so um, in other words, Voxelmorph is really useful even when you have just 10 images and most data sets now you have at least 30, 40, 50. Um, so that was good because now it's applicable. The other thing we kept sort of um, uh, seeing is that people always said, well, I, you know, I'm registering these anatomies, like let's say I'm registering this brain, but I don't really care. I really just care about the hippocampus because I want to correlate it with genetics or something. Um, I don't really care about the whole brain. So how do we tell the algorithm that you really only care about the hippocampus? In practice, classically, you would need to outline the hippocampus in your test data. And so if you have 5,000 images, you have to outline 5,000 hippocampi. That's a problem. Um, but what we thought is, well, maybe if you have just a few images with outlines, maybe you can use that during training. So the networks never see the outline, uh, the, sort of the labels. They only see the images. This makes sure that at test time, the network will only see the images. But during training, we're telling the network, well, you got to do everything you used to do. But now you also make sure that the labels of the hippocampi match or whatever labels you have. And what this is teaching the network to do is, in general, is teaching it to register. But it's also teaching it where the hippocampi is and to be more, to, to spend more of its energy there. And um, by doing this at training, now, again, at test time, we just give it images that don't have hippocampi labeled or anything. But for the first time, we saw that we can actually significantly improve over this, the state of the art, right? So 10% better than the classical methods we're able to do, which is substantial, right? Here, there's obviously no p-value question or anything. Um, and this is because the network underneath the hood is learning this kind of joint task. It's learning to align, but it's also learning kind of a soft um, segmentation underneath the hood. Um, and, and so it's able to do this. All right. Um, moving on to uh, sort of more recent projects. Um, and, and again, it's related. So we had, I'm going to go into a project that basically solves two problems. One of them is that medical images are actually incredibly diverse. Here I'm showing you MRI of the brain. And these are six different types of MRIs. They're all of the same brain. They're all um, what you would refer to as MRI, but they're what we call different modalities. So even within MRI, you, images look different. And so we know that networks have this issue that when you train them, uh, they are, you're very susceptible to the data you've trained with. And generalizing to other data is a challenge. And so if I train on this first modality, which a lot of people actually tend to have, um, our, my networks will probably never uh, be able to, to register or align these images or these images or even modalities between each other, right? And so, 
this is kind of disappointing because if you release a tool in practice to clinicians or scientists, the reality is it's not going to be very useful, um, even though you know it's fast and it's got gets this accuracy and so on. So we thought, okay, how do we get past this? Now we could try to gather up a lot of data and try train one big model, but that model will still never generalize to new data and new sequences that people come up with or to CT or something, right? So how do we make these networks robust to things that they haven't seen? And that's when we came up with this idea of essentially simulating brains, but the idea was to simulate brains so diverse, so extreme, so unrealistic that the network will essentially see so much um, variability in contrast that it will decide to ignore it. So let me show you what I mean. But uh, Adrian, yeah. um, I mean, this has been um, basically, there, there's many schools of thought here. So one of them in the sort of self-driving cars, for example, has a physical model of the world and then simulates novel scenes and stuff like that within that to then train the model. Uh -huh. And the other one basically says, I have an existing world and I'm going to modify that world according to a set of transformations. Yep. In both cases, the transformation that you put in and the types of scenario that you put in uh -huh. teaches the model about the diversity that it's going to be able to learn. Uh -huh. I'm curious, how are you driving those transformations and how much does that influence what you're learning? Or are you just trying to be not necessarily physically relevant, but at least diverse enough that the model learns to be robust to that variability? Right. So we did experiments comparing um, simulating data, simulating really diverse, crazy data that you would never see, uh, simulating data that we think is realistic, and taking existing data and just modifying it the way I think you're describing. Um, and the problem with the last two is that they are still in some ways constrained. So yes. if, you, if you simulate data that's somewhat realistic, you will often, well, at least in our experiments and what we were able to do, we weren't quite able to get the network to be quite as robust, especially to outliers. If you start with realistic data and try to modify it, that was significantly harder for us because um, basically we weren't, again, it, it was an issue of we weren't able to expose the network to enough variability, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, let me also maybe go through this slide the oh, next so couple and, then, and yeah. see if I, if I don't answer, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so what we do need for this first version of the, of the slide is some labels, uh, some, some image labels. Now you can download these, you know, from the internet because some brains have been labeled at some point, right? And so you can just download just the label maps, no images. And so what we do is we randomly uh, deform these images. So now we're generating kind of anatomical variability. We randomly fill in values, intensities with a bunch of different noise patterns uh, in the inside the label. So now we got something that kind of looks like a brain. We add all kinds of effects here. I'm showing just a blurred image, but we actually have a bunch of different effects we add kind of like errors you might get in an MRI. And then you get this is your final image. That's how we simulate data and we simulate crazier and crazier data. Like these are images you would never see. You would never have in the same tissue you know, black on the left of the brain and white on the right on the brain. But the point is that the network is going to be exposed to in so much variability that the real data will be included in there somewhere. So that was the idea. Uh, and so we started kind of doing these experiments for registration. Um, I mean, first we had some segmentation papers, but then we looked at registration and, you know, you take a brain, warp them in two different ways, fill in different values, different intensities, and that's your simulated data. Um, but then at some point we thought, well, we're really not really that constrained to the brains. What if we just fill in random shapes? So start with some random blobs, uh, deform them in two different ways, fill in random intensities, and that's, your, that's the data. So 
we fit we we push these images through the model, and this gives us a deformation field. Now, how do we tell whether this deformation is field is any good? You can't. It's really hard to tell by looking at the images because the images have been sort of filled in with very different contrasts. So you have to come up with these statistical measures and so on. But remember, we simulated these images starting with some segmentation maps. So we can always say, we can always give the network just the images, but we can ask the network if it registered the segmentation maps well. And this makes sure that the, the, the network essentially learns to figure out shapes from the images, but it also learns to ignore the exact intensity, right? It sort of figures out, well, the intensity doesn't matter. And that's the invariance we're trying to create here, right? Um, so let me, so that kind of sums up what we did. So we, we ended up training a bunch of different models. We trained some uh, voxel morph models starting with a particular type of MRI, but then trying to synthesize variability around that type of MRI. And then we tried two different versions of this model, which we call synthmorph because we're synthesizing beta. Two different versions of this model, one with random shapes, one with random brain images. Okay. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be showing here. Now, red are classical methods. Green are voxel morph models trained with some variability, and blue are the synth morph models. But here, what I'm registering are images of the same intensity, same intensity I trained with, and also same intensity when you register, like uh, image one and image two are of the same intensity. So classical models do well. We've pushed voxel morphs to do a little better now because we've added some variability and some robustness. And also we've kind of gotten better with these networks. And the models we train, the synthesized models, they never see any real data, but uh, they either have simulated blobs or simulated brains, do roughly the same as voxel morph. They do better than the classical models. And the model that's trained with completely synthetic brains does better than everyone, but roughly the same. Not not really a big deal. But of what course, with the uh, light green voxel morph that does really poorly in the middle one. So um, right. So so we trained two versions. One of them uh, is trained with th this metric called normalized cross correlation that we know is a very robust metric for same contrast. And then we also uh, trained with this other metric called normalized mutual information. And in general, that is a good metric for within, uh, within different contrasts. But within the same contrast, it's not as good. What's happening is it's, uh, uh, it computes these statistics. I mean, you know mutual information, right? So it computes these approximate statistics. And to do that, it kind of uh, needs this, it's kind of, it needs this like field of view and it's very approximate. And so it's basically the bottom line is it's not as robust, yeah. if that makes sense, right? Um, but again, it depends what you want to do, right? We know these are within contrast, so training with NCC makes more sense. But what happens when we start looking at modalities we, ha modalities we haven't seen and trying to register between modalities? And so this is what happens. The classical methods, they don't do quite as well. And part of the reason is exactly what I just said. The, the, the metrics that force us to look between modalities are, are these statistical measures and they tend to be nowhere near as accurate. They still get the right idea, but you start, start suffering. The voxel morph models, especially the one that was trained with NCC, the, the deep green one that did well within modality, just completely collapse because they've never seen these images before. They've never seen these modalities before. And so it just crashes. It's, it's and these awesome. are real images now. These are all, sorry, I should have made that clear, all real images. That's amazing, wow. All real images. And um, the synth morph data uh, models are remarkably robust. And I have to admit, I was surprised. So um, a, a little bit of a yeah. converse question, which is, is it possible to make that training space so large that the real images, you know, are kind of such a small subset that you're not really capturing their features anymore? Yeah, so uh, it's definitely a very good question. And the answer is that um, we see this happening as a function of model capacity. 
So if you have extremely diverse data simulated and your model is fairly limited, you have this issue where it does really well on training, but it starts suffering on real data because it's, as you say, it's only a small section. Yeah. Bigger you make these models, though, they start being able to cover the whole space very well. What's really phenomenal in the field of machine learning more generally is what we're learning now with capacity. Like we used to think, oh, it's few parameters is what you got to do. Right. <laughs> and uh, the whole field is moving towards, no, you just need a ton of parameters, just train it the right way. Yeah. And I, it's a, uh... I don't know. It's a bittersweet answer in some ways, but yeah, uh, this is. But it's not unlike our own brains. I mean, our brains have enormous capacity for the simple tasks that we're doing, and yet we're able to do one-shot learning and all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, so... yeah. No, you're totally right. Yeah. Cool. Um, let me show you uh, maybe a little bit in practice uh, what this means and why we're really, really excited. So here I'm. I'm simulating. Sorry, the first is a scan of a brain and it's just the same scan okay in like 12 different scenarios or something the second one is the same brain but we acquired um, this big sequence that you can simulate a bunch of different sequences so same brain exact same position but different sequences right smoothly varying and it's the same stuff as before red is classical models um, green is is uh, Green is voxel morph and blue is our method. And you can see that as you start complicating the, the, the modality, as it changes, classical models start suffering, voxel morph starts suffering, but synth morph, it does suffer a little bit, but you can see that it's quite robust. Um, we started asking ourselves, why is this happening? Like, what is the network doing? So we started poking at the network. Again, these diff four different contrast pairs here. Uh, voxel morph, if you look at the last, if you look at the features in the network towards the end of the network, you will see that the same feature, right, responds differently to these image pairs. So, you know, this is the same feature, same number, same channel, but, you know, it looks a little different because it is responding to what it sees. But synth morph has learned to completely ignore contrast. Like it's somehow extracting only the anatomy that matters. And these features are, after a while, they just don't respond to the contrast variation anymore. And so somehow there's in the network, it, it's learning to do that. Okay, there's a bunch of different features and we have more quantifiable things, but um, I do wanna move on. I wanna cover a couple more small projects. Um, I guess, any questions on that quickly? No, all good, okay. All right, there's one thing. So, so there were these two really big things that have plagued uh, voxel morph and well, every, everybody. One was this like invariance, and I really do believe we've solved a good chunk of it. The other problem is, well, this is a general problem. We need hyperparameter uh, tuning. And this is true of classical registration, and it's true of neural networks as well. There's usually some hyperparameter that's really, really, really important. And for us, one of those hyperparameters, the most important one, is this one that trades off between image matching and regularization. And it's always a problem, and it's always someone, some, something someone tunes. Uh, most of the time, obviously, graduate students, and most of the time, they do it by you train three or five models with different values at the start. You have no idea. And then you realize, oh, I got you know, it's somewhere in this range, but I got to train some more models and then you train some more models and then your data changes a bit and this whole process starts all over again. And so it's an extremely painful process. And um, so we, we thought, well, there's this one weird aspect here, which is these models are probably not that different. Um, you know, there's some slight variability in them, but probably they, they're not, you know, intuitively, they're not that crazy. So we thought, well, could we train one really large model, kind of a super voxel morph type model that we called hypermorph, where it learns the effect of the hyperparameter on your um, registration. Now, to be clear, it's not gonna give you the best hyperparameter for your registration because there is no such thing. Um, it, the best hyperparameter varies with the task and the data and what the clinician wants and things like that. But this network will learn the effect of every hyperparameter value on that um, uh, 
uh, on the registration fields. The, the sort of potential of this is that at the end of the day, you train one model and you just tune it afterwards uh, without having to retrain, without waiting for optimization, without anything. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, this is one variant of voxelmorph. The exact architecture doesn't matter. What matters is you take this hyperparameter value and you push, you, you put it into uh, the network as an input, okay? And you train it by giving it a bunch of different values that it sees. And you also apply those values in the loss. So when you say a value of 0 0.5, the network sees this as input, but it also knows that, oh, I have to give you a moderately regularized deformation field. If the value is zero, the network says, oh, I know that I'm not going to be penalized on my regularization. So I'm gonna give you as crazy of a deformation field as I can, and so on. So the network, by seeing the, def the hyperparameter value, it, it learns the effect on the, on the deformation field. Now, how do we actually do this? We've actually played with a, a few architectures, but interestingly, the thing that works phenomenally well is these, these things called hypernetworks. Basically what these are, they're, they're fairly small networks that take a value, in our case, they take a value and they output the weights of the voxelmorph network. They output the weights of the unit. So they essentially change the function as a, as a, as a function of the, of the hyperparameter value. And this works, uh, again, kind of surprisingly well. So just as an example, what you can do is you train a bunch of voxelmorph models, and this takes a lot of time, right? So we trained, I forget, I think 12 voxelmorph models here. So you see these gray uh, uh, circles. And you know, that takes a lot of time, and they're discrete. They're only at certain points. And then we trained a single hypervox model, which takes a little bit longer, but you just train one. And you can see that now, at inference, you can just tune the hyperparameter value and it, it matches up with those other models, right? So this means that a single hypermorph model is able to capture this now, huge range. Adrian, yeah, this doesn't seem to be constrained to voxel morph. This is probably a much more general machine learning technique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, I should have said this at the beginning. I have definitely turned image registration as a, as a sandbox of, of trying out new machine learning ideas. Yeah. Um, and so very much agree. What I'm talking about today applies broadly and I, don't, I can comment a lot on sort of how-, yeah, how it is. This is fascinating. Um, even just this setup, even just this setup of like a term plus a regularization is incredibly popular in machine learning, let alone other hyperparameters and other settings, but just yeah. this setup, right, is so broad. Yeah. Um, and, and so why, why are we able to, so, okay, this works across a bunch of different versions that you can do, but why does this actually work so well? It, and, and it doesn't take, you know, 10 times the time. It takes about 1.5 times the time of a single model. So, you know, you, you wait 150% as opposed to 1200. Why, why are, are you able to, well, it turns out that when you train two, three, four, five different models with different hyperparameter values, the models learn the same thing over and over again with slight modifications. And so the hyper network, hypermorph is able to capitalize on that shared information and essentially just learn this delta. Um, so in practice, in registration, this means a lot of things. Uh, the very idea I had originally was more about can I give this to a clinician and can they tune the hyperparameter value? And it turns out now you can, it's almost in real time. You can just sort of tune, you know, have a knob that kind of affects how much a brain changes, right? This is just a, as an illustration, obviously you want more fine tune and you want all kinds of other things, but you know, it's incredibly powerful interactively, but what we've actually found somewhat to our surprise is that the optimal hyperparameter value varies dramatically with a lot of things. And the ability of having just one model that you tune afterwards means you can tune this manually or you can tune it based on some a tiny bit of validation data. And all of a sudden, the data set, so here there are four different data sets and the optimal hyperparameter value is different. 
based on the quality of the data, the age of the patients in the data set, and so on. Uh, the type of registration task you do will give you different hyperparameter values. You could do between subjects or subject to a, to a reference frame or things like that. It will have different hyperparameter values, optimal. Even by region, so if you register the same brains but you care more about the hippocampus versus you care more about the ventricles, you will want to choose different hyperparameter values. And so all of this shows a couple of things. First, a single training a single model with a single hyperparameter value is not optimal and it, you shouldn't do it, at least for registration, but probably for a lot of tasks. And second of all, training just this one behemoth model, it's actually not that big, it's just, it looks big, um, is a really powerful tool. But I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time reconciling how different the hyperparameters for different regions of the brain need to be with the fact that you could get this whole thing started with random images getting warped. Right. So um, the advantage of that other, <laughs> that's true, that's a good point. Uh, the advantage of that other model that has these random shapes is um, you're getting something else there that is a little hard to describe. You're actually really, really, really focusing on, on anatomy there. Um, here, and so you're kind of learning to discern anatomy, um, even in very subtle noise. In here, what, I, what we trained in Hypermorph, we trained just a normal one trained on real data. And that's a little bit different because that one is not going to try to match up shapes at all, right? That's going to be more susceptible to noise in different regions. That's going to be, it's going to match up shapes that have a lot of contrast, but it's not going to match up shapes that have limited contrast. And so to answer your question directly, it might be a very different, this graph might look very differently in the synth morph case. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. The last thing I want to cover, I know I'm, sort of bordering on running a little late, but it's the last project, um, is because I, I really like it, is this, um, this idea that, well, a lot of times we, we align all our data to a common reference frame, but in a lot of projects, we don't have a common reference frame. We could choose one example as a common reference frame that has all kinds of problems. Classically, we build references. We build these kind of centroidal brains or other anatomy with this complicated process where you, you initialize it in some way, maybe you just blur an image or something, and then you register everyone to that image, uh, average those registrations, and then you register everyone again and you average, and it takes forever. Um, so classically, there are algorithms. Honestly, it's not really done in practice because it takes so long. And so we started thinking about this. Everyone said, well, great, we can register, but we need a template. And so, we thought, well, wait a minute, the Atlas is already learning something about the population, right? It's, it, it gets to see all these data and somehow it's learning to approximate the result of registration. So instead of, let's say we're learning a network that registers images to an Atlas, instead of giving the, the network the Atlas, what if we just tell it to estimate this Atlas at the same time as it's learning to register? Basically what we're saying is, oh, there's an image here, but it's not an input anymore. You have to estimate the intensities. And so we're just going to feed it data. We're just going it, to feed it an image at a time. And over time, the network learns what is the best atlas, the best common reference frame for everybody that I can align images to, right? And this is what we got. And it's really cool because this, is, this looks quite good for a template for our data, but also we never made any sophisticated changes. It was really just voxel morph with a couple of little changes on, on getting it to learn this atlas. Importantly, it's, it learns really nice anatomy as I'm gonna show you in a second. But the real reason I'm excited is because now we have this tool that is so flexible that we can solve a lot of problems that were fundamental classical problems that were hard to solve. So for example, let's say you have a really large population of subjects. This means usually a single template is not a good representation. So it, it, your analysis isn't going to be that good. So let's say you have 15 year olds and 90 year olds in your data set, those brains will look different. So you would really love to, to sort of build different templates. And so classically what people would do is they would sort of 
put people into bins and learn separate atlases. Of course, that has all kinds of problems because it's very discreet, very approximate. So what we thought is, well, what if we learn these, what we call conditional templates? So we're not going to learn a template at all. We're going to learn a function that gives me a template as a, as a function of a property I care about. It could be age, could be sex, could be some sort of genetic information, could be some sort of diagnosis. Um, but we're going to go with age as an example. So now I'm going to feed in, when I, when I get the brain of a patient, I'm going to feed that to the network, but I'm going to also feed in that patient's age. And over time, the network learns this very smooth sort of age-dependent atlas um, uh, as it sees, you know, the whole population. And it looks something like this. Now here I'm just showing you seven instances, right? Seven different ages, but you can see that it's learning um, certain effects uh, between this brain and this brain, right? So they're very, uh, for example, these ventricles are much smaller here for people who are um, in their teens or um, these ventricles are much larger here. In fact, I can show this in video form, which I like. It's a very depressing video if you sort of know neuroanatomy, basically it's showing that the brain shrinks with time. These ventricles in the middle, which are basically just filled with fluid, grow and the rest of the brain, here it is again, the rest of the brain shrinks. And the really cool thing is we learned this from data alone. We never modeled any anatomy. We never explicitly in, in, uh, you know, created some sort of constraint. Of course, we can add those for, for modeling purposes, but we can then so, look. Adrian, yeah. building up a little bit on uh, the variational to encoders that we've seen in the class earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, if you don't explicitly give age, but you just tell it basically learn, you know, a family of models across different parameterizations, whether the, the system would automatically learn the concept of age as a parameter of variation yeah. in a fashion. For sure. So we, we tried this and um, it, so it will learn the highest variability kind of hidden covariates. And then it turns out those highest variability covariates correlate very much with age and they correlate very much with some very bad neurodevelopmental problems like Alzheimer's, right? Wow, so, so, we, so we ran that and I mean, we, you know, I don't know if what they're learning is actually age or just something that's deeper than that, but that correlates with age, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but, um, but yeah, definitely. So exactly what you're saying is the sort of stuff I'm excited about because now we can actually try these sort of things, right? Yeah, and, uh, and, and learn about parameters we didn't know about before. And that's what's very cool, basically. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the genetics part is actually one of the things we're actively doing, too, So, which, again, like offers more you know, interesting directions. And so you can actually measure these changes, and you can actually verify them against the sort of stuff we knew. Hippocampus shrinks with age. You know, ventricles shrink. Uh, we can also run these for... Um, at, for, for, for populations we don't have atlases for, or very good atlases for nowadays. So DHCP is this large, um, you know, effort for developmental uh, brains. And those are challenging. They brain, these are, these are very young um, subjects, right? 29 weeks. We even have some that are in the days, you know, kind of five days after birth. Um, and, you know, the brain changes like crazy then, like there's folds that shape, it, intensity is a change and so on. And we can build those atlases now, um, which I'm, I'm really excited about. Um, so before I kind of close with the summary, I just want to acknowledge that you know, there's a lot of projects, a lot of really great students and collaborators. Um, so I, again, I didn't talk about this, but underneath all this, there's this probabilistic generative models that you can write that drive this whole thing. Connected to variational inference, you can get these unsupervised neural networks um, that have uh, really been a new paradigm. They're really fast. They're definitely accurate. They have all kinds of properties that we wanted in the past, the homomorphisms, which I didn't get to talk about, but they basically guarantee these smooth invertible fields. You can get uncertainty estimates. But really, uh, they have all these other cool properties. Answer to limited data. You can use segmentations if you want to help you along. If you don't have an atlas, you can build one. You can build in variances to, to contrasts. Uh, and really, this applies sort of broadly, as uh, Manolo has pointed out. A lot of these concepts are, are really just a lot broader machine learning concepts. And that's it. Thank you.
Awesome. I want to uh, ask everybody to join me in thanking Adrian for an awesome, awesome uh, lecture. So thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are also fortunate to have uh, Ahmed Kadir Mohammed, who is joining us as well, to give us um, another guest lecture. So yeah. let me stop the show. Okay. I got it. So Ahmed, uh, yes. Start okay. sharing your screen. Yeah. Okay. Give me a sec. And then uh, everyone, you can find the slides in Canvas and also at this Dropbox link. Thank you so much, Adrian. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Everybody's able to get access to the slides. Great. And then we can see your screen. Beautiful. Awesome. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, you might want to do uh, swap displays. Okay, and maybe let me stop sharing them. Yeah. Uh, how about now? We can see the whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah perfect. Is off. Uh, if it's yeah. perfect, that's okay, but. No, no, I'll just uh, turn it on. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, right. perfect. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was looking at the lectures and uh, they are very interesting. Uh, and thank you for uh, making it available for everyone to see as well. Uh, they are very interesting. So the, my presentation is on uh, automatic pathology detection, uh, mostly for capsule video endoscopy. So this is a collaboration work uh, with NTNU, Norwegian University of Science Technology and a Jovic uh, hospital uh, here in Norway. So uh, from what I see, most of the, 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 uh, the modalities, medical modalities you have been checking are very different from what I'm presenting. So I will go through some of uh, the modality that we are working on, which is capsule video endoscopy and colonoscopy. Uh, if you guys know it already, then to be a nice summary of uh, what it is. So the motivation for uh, our work is uh, uh, the colon, the human colon, uh, which, uh, for example, the colorectal cancer detection and something like that. So if you have a normal colon, then the wall of the colon will be very smooth, uh, as you see it here. So uh, you have a smoother uh, surface. And when you have uh, some disease, for example, like arthritis colitis or Crohn's disease, then that will be eroded and you have uh, or a Crohn's disease, then you have bleeding or something uh, similar. So the colorectal cancer is uh, a major source of uh, uh, death from cancer. And uh, if you have uh, arthritis colitis or Crohn's disease, then it could also have higher risk of developing a colon tumor or rectal tumor. So it is very uh, important to uh, detect it early on. So uh, the human colon is like around 150 centimeter uh, long and compared to a small intestine, which is long and narrower. So the typical way of uh, investigating it is through a colonoscope, where the doctor inserts a colonoscope and try to see uh, the walls of the colon for any kind of abnormalities. But as you can see, this is... Uh, this is actually recommended by doctors, mostly uh, after the age of 50, uh, depending on the country. And uh, there is a lot of, it's not uh, accepted that much by the patients. So there are alternative ways of imaging this. And that is uh, where it comes to capsule video endoscopy. So a capsule is uh, a small uh, peel size camera, which is 31 by 11 millimeters long uh, size. And you have uh, a DOOM sensor and you have a, a battery and you have an antenna a transmitter and uh, the, the patient will wear a vest and the, the image will be transmitted through that vest, uh, basically. So the, it produces a, lot of, a large amount of frames, around 50,000 frames. And it takes Hello. almost- uh, I mean, Sorry to be uh, so, so yeah. long here, but- 
one of the advantages of a uh, colonoscopy from the other direction is that you actually empty the colon yeah. so that you can actually see polyps, etc. If this is done without actually emptying it out, is yeah, it possible yeah. that it actually misses a lot of the features that would otherwise be visible? Yeah, uh, so uh, that is colon cleaning procedure. Uh, that is done for both colonoscope and uh, capsule video endoscopy. Got it, got it. So it's yeah. just that you don't have to do the other part. So the other question is, yeah. if something is swallowed in an empty stomach, does it sort of change the way that it travels? Does it need yeah. to wait for food to actually come? And when the food comes, will it yeah. block and obstruct its view? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th that's true. So uh, you need to be, uh, for example, if you are doing colonoscope, I hope none, none of you does. Uh, you take some regimen uh, which cleans the colon completely, and then you, you have empty colon. This, you do the same thing, but you, you take extra procedure for this, for capsule video endoscopy, because you need uh, full empty stomach. Plus, as you can see, it is, it is going with the food. So you are not flexible in imaging where you want to image. So, for example, the, uh, and especially in the colon, the colon is a bit wider. That's why I bring it early on, yeah. compared to a small bowel. So, since it can go, uh, the, the polyps could appear in the folds of the the, yeah. in the colon. Then you, you could easily miss it. So that's a huge problem with this uh, approach. Yeah. Another question that I have is a lot of the food after it exits the stomach, it's already much smaller than the size of the capsule. Yeah, are there are issues that are just simply geometric in getting through the small intestine. So th that's also a very important point. So uh, that's actually a huge, uh, not a huge problem, but there is a solution to it. So, for example, there are some diseases called uh, diverticulus. I will show you some with the result where you have uh, holes, basically, in your oh, colon wow. pads, and then it could stuck there. Wow. <laughs> so the usual approach uh, or the medical solution for this is uh, usually doctors will give you one dissolvable capsule early on. Wow. So th that's, that's like an extreme case where you have known such kind of problems. Yeah. But in any case, if the capsule is going to be stuck, it is almost uh, you need to do surgery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if it doesn't, for example, if the, if the food is starts stacking somewhere, a bacteria will be developed, so you'll have surgery anyway. So yeah. it will not be harmful uh, to do that surgery. Got it. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah no, yeah, no worries. So the, this capsule just travels uh, in the colon. So to show you some of the videos that, uh, that come from the capsule, is uh, if you look at this, uh, this is from actual uh, colon capsule too. And if you look at the video, you can see that it's not as uh, good as the HD uh, image quality. And for the doctors, what do they need is uh, the vessels should need to be visible because the vessels have a lot of information to give and you don't need a lot of specular reflection. And you need also the color should not be distorted otherwise you need to retrain the doctors to uh, do this again. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very surprised by how straight it goes. I would expect it to do a lot more tumbling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it depends, like, for example, in this case, it's going here and there. But uh, it depends, for example, if it is ascending colon and descending colon. Uh, like uh, when it's descending colon, it's going fast. So when it's ascending colon, it's going slow. So it depends where you are. And when it's traversal colon, it's very, it depends uh, where you are imaging. Wow, thank you. Yeah. And but, but, uh, like regarding the video, if you look at, if you look at it, it doesn't have smooth uh, transition uh, as you wish for with the smartphone uh, cameras currently have. So you don't have this phi effect, which appears you have uh, this living picture moving picture, uh, which makes it a video. Uh, you lack like that. And of course, if you want to transmit a lot of frames, then you're going to kill the battery, which is around eight hours, uh, or approximately, uh, or sometimes it takes six hours less than that. But then you're going to kill the battery. So you need to save the battery as well. You don't want to send a lot of frames. And uh, 
but uh, you can see the videos are not smooth. So I, I would like to give you the, on the next on the next, next video I'm going to show you. I would like to give you uh, try to see any kind of abnormality you can see you can find on this one. So let me know if you find anything uh, worth investigating. I know you are not medical doctors. I don't know if maybe there are some medical doctors in your class. So do you see anything unique in this video? Bubbles. There are bubbles, and there is also one nine millimeter polyp that is hanging in the wall. Uh, it, it just comes around here. That giant red thing? Here, yeah, yeah exactly. That's a, a polyp. And the challenge is like you have this polyp coming, appearing, and uh, disappearing very fast. So the doctor needs to be very attentive when, when looking at these videos. So the other problem issue you have is like you have a lot of uh, uh, diseases like uh, even the polyps that are sessile where you have a broad uh, base on the colon and you have pedunculated the one that grow like mushrooms and you have neoplastic which are more dangerous one uh, like uh, adenomas and uh, hyperplastic which are not deadly but so you have a lot of variations of this and you have different states of uh, this disease. So if you want to do uh, some sort of machine learning, then uh, the problem, uh, then you end up with uh, having absence of lack of data. So uh, you have around this a lot of video frames, uh, around 50,000 video per patient. And if you want to do uh, medical uh, in general, medical data annotation is super expensive and slow, and you need multiple doctors to approve a given, uh, a given, uh, I'm not seeing a comment or if there's a question on, on the chat. Uh, don't worry, if there are questions, uh, the staff will uh, ask you or we'll answer them. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So, and also you have this private issue and the limited access uh, when it comes to, uh, like uh, especially in Europe, you have GDPR regulations, and uh, you have uh, a lot of privacy issues. You have a lot. You have to do a lot of paperwork. And the other problem is you have uh, this diverse pathologies and long video sequence. So the problem is this annotation where you need the people to do the labeling of the data. So uh, in the current talk, uh, I'm planning. Uh, what I'm planning to do is to go through some of. Uh, the machine learning approaches that we have been doing in regard to uh, how to do machine learning in absence of data or with the lack of data. Uh, so that's the main uh, problem that we are uh, working on in our group. So uh, typically, uh, some of the ways to handle uh, lack of data is uh, one is transfer learning or domain adaptation. Uh, weekly supervised learning and self-supervision, uh, of course, Holy Grail is, of course, unsupervised learning. If you can do unsupervised, then you are good to go. Yeah, so uh, I will try to uh, cover uh, at least the top three uh, works that we have been working on. So earlier approach, uh, so I will take you now for a colonoscopy kind video polyp detection problem. So earlier workers in uh, colonoscopy polyp detection they take this uh, uh, shape information, for example, uh, the curvature information of the image to, to try to model what a polyp looks like. So if, uh, if you try to model it, it's like it, it has, compared to the surrounding area, polyp have uh, higher curvature uh, as compared to uh, the normal tissue. So you can do some sort of intensity by detection or something like that. But the problem is you'll have this hyper false positives and, uh, and that means the doctor needs to check it anyway. So th that's a big problem. And uh, there have been since the deep learning come uh, to uh, mainstream, uh, there have been a lot of work uh, that try to do uh, deep learning on it. For example, uh, using CNN with on RGB image or adding some geometric features or uh, there are also uh, transfer learning approaches where you try to uh, fine tune image net trained weights 
or 3D CNN using the video as uh, a whole sequence and doing 3D convolutions. So the, the work I'm presenting today is uh, one is uh, Ynet. So this approach is we try to use, we try to exploit uh, the advantage of pre-trained weights and also random initialization. And we try to address some of uh, domain uh, performance loss due, due to domain shift. So the architecture is basically, if you look at early, a lot of work is the focus, especially for object detection, uh, image segmentation, most of the focus is on the decoder side. So in this work, what we try to do is uh, we, ha we have the, uh, an input image, then uh, we have different variation of this input image. So uh, this is a general uh, approach. So we have this uh, encoders. So we have two encoders. One is uh, uh, pre-trained from ImageNet and the other is uh, pre-trained and uh, random initialized weights. Then on each image, the images are uh, augmented, not geometric augmentation that changes the, the mask of the image, but uh, any kind of augmentation like intensity augmentation or uh, contrast enhancement and uh, something like that. Then uh, what we try to do is uh, since you, like for example, if you already pre-trained this weights and this is random and this is pre-trained and you have different variations of uh, the input. So the assumption is the mask will not change anyway uh, due to the augmentation. So you want to have this consistent kind of representation. Yeah, so then, uh, so we, we start with uh, pre-trained uh, BGG network which is uh, trained uh, on ImageNet. Then the second encoder is uh, random initialized, but the image is transformed uh, or enhanced, uh, uh, any kind of augmentation. Then what we, uh, what we did uh, next is we modify the learn grade based on which encoder you are training on. So uh, if you have, for example, uh, if you are training, if you have the encoder of uh, the first encoder, which is Pre-trained from ImageNet, we know that earlier layers learn something important. Uh, uh, for example, like a color uh, and early features. So uh, primitive features. So you want to keep those features. So you don't want to fine tune those uh, layers that much. So you you take higher learn rate on the other encoders that are initialized from random. Then. Uh, so it depends on which encoder you are training on. So you have this encoder-based learning rate. Then we take the binary cross entropy and the uh, uh, dice loss function uh, together. So for the data set, uh, for this one, uh, I will come later on. We collected our own data set as well. But for this one, we take the, uh, the publicly available data sets uh, called the ICU Myo Clinic data set. And we have uh, 20 and 18 short segment colonoscopy videos for training and testing. So they are split. And out of that one, uh, 4,278 frames have polyps and the remainings are negative. And the, the same is for the test. So for evaluation, we took a precision uh, recall a F1 and F2 score. So a lot of people, uh, especially when in medical imaging, I think recall is very important uh, as compared to precision. Uh, because if you have high recall, uh, then uh, if you have low recall, that means if you miss detecting, then the, he will develop a tumor. So that's a problem. Then we did some ablation study. So the first thing we did was uh, we just take the unit architecture. Then if you uh, train from scratch, then yeah, the performance are, for F1 score is around 54.7. And if you use unit pre-trained on VGG single encoder, then that actually helps. So uh, that's around 79. And if you use Ynet, which is uh, multiple variation of the same input, you get around 85.9. So we also compare with other existing methods and uh, this is uh, the, the, the result. So uh, let me show you some videos. Uh, so uh, this is a, 
Uh, that's a, so this is a poly so if you look at this, this is the asset, it's, it, you can't say this is natural asset because uh, it's, it's it's like in normal case the doctor so this, this is the observer effect that is common in uh, vision problems as well uh, like here the coronoscope is moving very slow but uh, in real case the doctor will be very fast he have a lot of patients and he will be doing, but this is the assets that currently available and a lot of people are using it. Yeah, it's not that fun to watch. So if you guys don't like it, I, I can just pause and pass. Yeah. So uh, the next thing we try to do is we try to collect our own asset. Uh, so, uh, uh, the problem is uh, the supervised learning problem, and I will come to that. What what, uh, what it means? Uh, so we have around fifty thousand image for for given procedure, and we collected around uh, forty one videos. That's a lot of frames to label, and so we can't label this. So it's uh, it's very hard problem. So the, what we what we try to do is we try to formulate this problem into multiple multiple instance learning. Well, annotation, but you don't have uh, individual label for each component, uh, each element in the bag. So, uh, so the assumption is like you have a bag, which for, for example, this could be a bunch of frames. You have a label for all of them, but you don't have the labels for ind individual frames. So it could be that you have a video and the video it says like, okay, this video contains a tumor, but it doesn't tell you where the tumor is. Uh, one simple approach, for example, if you want to solve this is, you take, okay, let's say, let's take the labels of the bag to be the labels of the, uh, the individual components and you can do a supervised learning problem, but that will not give you uh, an, an optimal solution because you, in the video, not all of them have the polyp. So some of them have, for example, some of the, in the video, some of them are negative classes. So you have that problem. So, but that's, uh, yeah, if you want to do uh, a simplified version of the problem is you just assign the label of the bag to the individual frames. Then if you do self uh, fully uh, supervised learning, you will get some result, but it's not the optimal result. The other approach would be is uh, since you only have the labels for the video, uh, what you can do is like you, you try to uh, uh, predict for individual contribution from each frame, then you optimize the loss on the final uh, video label of the aggregation. So that's uh, what uh, what has been uh, like uh, in this paper. That's what they did. So the basic assumption of uh, uh, multiple instance learning is you have this positive bag and this negative bag. Uh, uh, the shape of this positive bag and negative bag has nothing to do with the uh, with the actual, <laughs> so it's just a bad drawing from my side. So what the assumption is basically uh, positive bag at least contain one, one of the pathologies that, yeah, that you are interested in, but the negative bag is always negative. There is nothing negative, uh, positive in the negative bag. So uh, if you assume uh, like the uh, frame one and frame and the video contains uh, n frames, and any the total number of frames. Then uh, for each frame, you don't know this label, but you what but what you know is the label of the video as a group. So the mean constraint problem you can reformulate it as such that uh, this is a, the pathology you are interested in, such that uh, y n is basically the frame, the frame that contain any pathology will be the, the label for the whole bag. Or you can also uh, alternatively formulate as uh, 
the maximum on all, all frames that are that contain the pathology. So if you look at the problem specifically, how to find which frames uh, contain the pathology as compared to the, the rest of the video. So uh, to do that, uh, what we started is uh, we have these videos with pathologies and uh, normal videos. And we converted, uh, we extracted uh, ResNet 50 features from for each frame. Then we pass through the uh, residual LSTM blocks. So this uh, res residual LSTM blocks are uh, contains bidirectional to bidirectional LSTM, and you have a skip connection uh, taking uh, the raw uh, image feature uh, to the output hidden layer. So what we are interested in is basically how to find these alphas. So basically this is a contribution uh, of uh, each frame to the final video classification problem. Then what the only thing we have is actually this the final video classification. So these alphas are basically the contribution. So if you are able to find Okay, I'm afraid we've lost our uh, guest speaker. Um, I was a little frightened earlier when we had a little bit of a disruption. So I Any folks have questions to ask? or uh, anything else? I'm gonna pause the recording again. So, yeah. And uh, high attention, why? Okay, uh, so yeah. Yeah, perfect. So uh, one thing you can exploit is uh, high attention uh, value frames are, uh, are are supposed to contain pathology. So you can exploit this one. So if you have, a, you can try to move the positive high attention um, pathology uh, frames uh, with respect to the negative classes and you try to separate them apart. Then the, the final loss function will be then the, uh, the uh, final cross entropy of the video uh, classification as well as the separation of the bags between the positive and negative bags. So to do that, we uh, we went to the doctor. So this is how we annotated the data set. So this is a, a rapid reader uh, where the doctors normally use. So we have this uh, thumbnail. So the doctor just leaves some comment here and we just extract some uh, video segment from that region. And we collected around uh, 455 uh, small segment videos. And I, I think this is the largest capsule video endoscopy uh, that has it. Then the one thing we did was also try to analyze the uh, uh, where to put an attention. So for example, uh, so uh, what I mean is basically where you want to learn this attention, the contribution. Uh, so we did a, an ablation study where uh, we take, for example, we take the output of resident and apply attention on that. Or uh, the other uh, alternative would be is you take the input uh, feature from resident and uh, have attention on the LSTM blocks or have uh, an input to attention block from the LSTM and having it on the LSTM. Or you can also have uh, another kind of uh, ablation study where you have this uh, trying to move the high attention classes from low attention classes. And uh, so if you look at the final results, um, out of this, the one that give you the best is vertically if you attend the final hidden representation and applied on the final uh, up, uh, or on the final output that will give you the best performance and we compared it with the other approaches uh, that uses uh, metric learning so this of some of the methods 
here, we just implemented them for capsule video endoscopy, but uh, some of this work is very similar to activity recognition kind of problem uh, in natural video uh, analysis. So we, we implemented them and we tested uh, against it. So I'll show you some, uh, some results we have. Uh, this is a diverticulous case. So this is the attention or the networks what it sees. So, so the diverticulus is basically, this is the diverticulus. So you can see that when it sees the diverticulus, the network starts firing. So the, uh, the otherwise attentions will be uh, like there is no attention to other frames. Yeah, so this is erythema uh, and the erosion. So I don't know how many of you will know uh, erythema and erosion unless you guys are medical doctors. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So the other approach that you could follow would be is if you don't have a lot of labeled data is self-supervision. So I think you guys have seen uh, this block diagram uh, a lot. So basically in self-supervision, what you have is the data contains some sort of la the label and that you try to learn that one. And you, you train supervised uh, basically. So in NLP, for example, you try to predict the next word in a sentence. So in image processing, uh, like in computer vision, one of such famous work is basically uh, try to predict the rotation. So you have the, an image and you rotate it by 90 degrees and uh, uh, different type of degrees. And you try to predict what is the, rotate, the angle and use this one for uh, warm starting your training or uh, it's actually falls under representation learning problem. So this, do, you do you guys think this will work for capsule video endoscopy? <laughs> well, all the images are tumbled up, so I guess not. Oh, yeah, exactly. So uh, that's one problem when you work on medical imaging. So if you look at the, the colon, you can't see you are great, uh, looking upside down because there is no, uh, it's a rotation invariant. So you need to come up with different ways of uh, learning some representation. So uh, one approach that we find kind of working is a jigsaw problem where you have, where you partition the image into patches and you pass through the uh, an encoder. So each patch you pass through an encoder, then you try to reconstruct the image. Uh, In all honesty, Ahmed, I don't know how well I would do at that task. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it, it's, uh, so even I, I asked, uh, I have uh, medical collaborators and they, they are, it's very hard for them as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so in this problem is basically try to, uh, yeah, uh, reorganize the frames. We've seen many of these uh, uh, problems in uh, our previous lectures. So it's very nice to see them again in practice. Yes, exactly, yeah. So what we found is basically they form some sort of cluster, but they, the clusters are not meaningful, uh, pathologically meaningful. Like for, you want to have, uh, Something that, so uh, basically, this is called pretext task. So a pretext task is this free task that you do, and the downstream task is uh, the one that we are interested in, which is uh, pathology classification. So now what we see is basically we, we don't have that much of that pathology classification. What we have is another interesting uh, classification. So if you, for example, if you input this image, what you get is something that looks similar, but it doesn't mean it is uh, clinically significant class, uh, classification. So we are looking into a lot of these pretext tasks now. Uh, maybe uh, I'll share another time uh, some of the, the works on this side. So in conclusion, uh, what we see is it's important to, uh, to improve the video frame localization. Uh, through domain knowledge. For example, if you have uh, Crohn's disease uh, as compared to uh, arthritis colitis, this Crohn's disease could be, um, it, it starts for example, it starts from, if arthritis colitis starts from rectum and it goes up 
and the Crohn's disease can happen anywhere. So there is some pathological information that could be interesting to use uh, to try to uh, localize the disease more precisely. So we are looking into that as well. And the other thing that's interesting to look into is uh, weekly supervised uh, uh, video segmentation. So now we don't know, we can localize the frame, but we can't detect where it is. Uh, that's very uh, important, at least for explanation uh, case. Uh, also designing uh, novel self-supervised pretest tasks or contrastive learning. That's also uh, super cool ideas uh, that are also, there is a lot of work coming out almost every day on such kind of approaches. Yeah, and uh, what will be interesting would be is to test this in real medical procedure and see how much it can uh, reduce the, the workload. So uh, acknowledgement, I would like to acknowledge the uh, ICMED project and we are situated in Norway. Uh, so we are from Jovik here, if you guys visited uh, Norway. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. Thank you thank you so yeah. much. It's again, yeah. wonderful to hear the perspective of real practitioners solving actual medical problems. And yeah. uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here. So I want everybody to join me in uh, thanking Ahmed for a wonderful lecture. And uh, thank you all, and uh, see you, um, I guess, on Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye, Khmer. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.